I think nature is so very important to me because it's always been my best friend, my first and best friend, a place where I can always find comfort, solace, where I feel, it may be funny to say, but I feel listened to and, uh, and understood at a level that doesn't happen in uh, any other aspect of life, as far as I can tell. And somehow that relationship with nature has always been there for me and my music. John Denver had an extraordinary gift. The ability to transform the wonders of nature into music that touched the hearts and minds of people around the world. His songs speak to us of a deep kinship with the wild and its power to enrich the human spirit. This is the story of John's lifelong love affair with the natural world. A journey to the wild places that profoundly shaped his life. It would turn out to be his last journey and our last chance to share the experiences that inspired him to become a universal voice for the wild. I've had enormous success, experiences not very many people have the collection of, of experiences that I've had. You know, what else do you want to do? So it's not about being successful. I've had that. But I keep singing and, and working on because I know that's the vehicle that allows me to be a voice out there in the world and to, to do something about the things I care about. Let this be a voice for the river. Let this Any time you can be in the wilderness, it's pretty special as far as I'm concerned. But this place has an even greater significance for me. This is where the little Colorado River gives itself to the mighty Colorado and the Grand Canyon. And a long time ago, when I was 12 years old, I was inspired by the headwaters of this little stream to write my first song. Sitting on the banks of a lazy little stream Oh, how I wish it wasn't a dream It's all I remember. But I'll never forget that it was nature that gave me my voice. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah River. Country Roads was John's first big international hit. It was 1971. John had found his voice, and its message was heard everywhere. Country Roads, take me home. To the place I belong, West Virginia, Mountain Mama. Despite differences in language and culture, everyone responded to the desire to live in harmony with nature. John's growing celebrity brought him unique opportunities, and in 1975, he got to meet a personal hero, Jacques Cousteau. Mountain Mama. He is someone that is so much bigger than life in many ways that I constantly catch myself stepping back and just sort of looking at him and you can't believe that you're actually able to, uh, to spend time with him. 
it's, uh, it's all one world. And everything has originated in the sea, and the water cycle is the life cycle. Jacques' son, Jean-Michel, remembers their first meeting. John Danvers was invited on board Calypso, and uh, he was so inspired by the experience that he had that he, one, went diving, scuba diving, and I believe this was the first time he had put his nose underwater. And that night, he was so high that he started writing a song, and he spent most of the night writing High Calypso. There's so much life and so much color. Was that a barracuda? Yeah. John is very much a Renaissance man in the sense that he is as good as music as he is talking about the environment. And of course, his music, in many cases, um, celebrate the environment. To sail on a dream, on a crystal clear ocean, to ride on the crest of a wild storm, to work in the service of life and the living, in search of the answers to questions unknown, to be part of the movement, part of the growing, Part of beginning to understand. I can show the places you've been to, things you've shown us, the stories you tell. I can show the things we go through. In the past, so long and so well, for the lady, for the love. From Cousteau, John learned how one person of vision can move those around him to action. Cousteau's work was an inspiration. As a performer, John had the world's attention, and he knew that his music could do more than entertain. I got the chance to do documentaries, and I loved it. We were talking about something, we were out in nature, and, and I just had both a really, really strong, deep feeling about what we were doing and using my music to call uh, attention to, to these things. It was while writing the music for a film called The Eagle and the Hawk that John met Morley Nelson, a legend among those who know the birds of prey. Morley has devoted his life to promoting and protecting eagles, hawks, and other raptors. All right, now we go. Yo! Not far from his home in Boise, Idaho, Morley practices the ancient art of falconry. The jeer falcon, released to the freedom of the skies, returns to the lure. Morley's years spent training and living with the birds have given him an intimate knowledge of their character and how they live. Golden eagle sitting on the rock. Now that's the golden eagle that lives up there. His, his head is golden, but he has no white in his tail. Morley guides bird watching tours in Idaho's Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area, a preserve he was instrumental in establishing. The Snake River Canyon is home to over 800 pairs of eagles, hawks, owls, and falcons. They depend on the area's abundant prey and the sheer cliffs that provide ideal nesting sites. What did you do to get this place set up like it is? Well, my sons and I proved that the birds were here. Nobody would believe it. They said, well, there's nothing like that any place. And we counted 212 pairs of prey falcons and 52 pairs of eagles and I realized that we had a unique area in the world that should be conserved forever. 
What's this guy? That's the prey falcon going there. You see the long pointed wings and the, <laughs> the speed that they've got. He's just uh, taking it easy, but he's, he's going this way he's supposed to go. When did you first get interested in these birds? Oh, 69 years ago when I saw one of these falcons. There, there he go. goes. Oh! <laughs> you see, that's what gives you the thrill. That's what I saw, only it was, I thought, the fastest thing in the world. And I said, holy mackerel, i got to have one of those, and I have ever since. I think nature must have been, and every aspect of nature was man's first inspiration. I think it was too, because it was always, you, they were inspired by something that was beyond our ability, which that certainly is, except in a jet plane. The son of an Air Force test pilot, John knew from personal experience the incredible speed and freedom of flight. Flying was more than a family tradition. For John, it was a passion. And like the birds themselves, it is a constant theme in his music. To belong to the sky, to be at home with this complete freedom, is to soar on the wings of eagles. Morley still routinely monitors eagles' nests along the canyon's vertical walls. Well, you know, when you were with me the first time 27 years ago, you, I put you over the cliff down the snake river, and you said, well, I'm going to learn to do that. And now you're looking great and doing better than ever. I need to do this more than once every 27 years, Morley, to really feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> do I need to worry about scaring this guy? Or just yeah, you've got to be worried about scaring him. You, it's still, we've got to go real slow because... Uh, he's big enough to fly if he has to go. How old are you, Morley? Well, 81. Oh, God. Can you see him at all? <laughs> yeah, you bet. Hello there, big one. He's got another uh, three or four days before he may try to fly. A bobcat, a mountain lion, anybody, nobody dared to go near that baby eagle because the mother eagle would come down and, and take them out. And as you know, they hunt wolves in Russia to this day with golden eagles because yeah. they can take a wolf by the head and just kill him so quick, it's uh, amazing. They've adapted to humanity. Look at all the action down below us. You see, as long as people don't disturb them and don't shoot at them, uh, they stay there. Is there still a problem with people shooting at them? Oh, the shooting is a terrible problem. Every year, dozens of birds are shot, hit by cars, and entangled by power lines, the casualties of advancing civilization. Morley finds it impossible to understand why anyone would deliberately harm them. They've been such an inspiration to humanity since the beginning of time. And then they had this nobility in life, where they say, if somebody's going to kill me, I'm going to kill them first. And that's the way their life is. It's just like a soldier in battle. i got to kill that son of a gun or he's going to kill me. And boy, that's the way they live. He can tear anything apart, any kind of meat. She I has can a, feel her, her grip through Oh, the man. She could take that foot and put you out of your misery, you see. But yet, look at that character. He can't not be inspired looking at a creature like this. There's nothing in the world like the American West. The wide open spaces, these mountains, uh, the desert, the incredible beauty of the landscape. Everywhere you look, in all the places that I've traveled, everywhere that I've been, there's something about the American West that personifies personal freedom, adventure, a frontier, the opportunity to make our own world, to make it what we dream it can be. In Yellowstone National Park, a dream of restoring the wild frontier of the American West has actually come true. In a decision marked by controversy, wolves have been brought back to the park after an absence of more than 60 years. Today, their song once again 
fills the backcountry. Now Yellowstone is complete. To celebrate, John begins work on a new song. Despite all the years he has spent in wild country, this is John's first trip down the Colorado. As the river carries him ever deeper into the heart of the American West, he plans to continue working on his new wilderness song. Traveling into the canyon is traveling back in time. It's an adventure he is eager to share with his son, Zach, and daughter, Jessie. See this? What is that? That's a fossil. It's called a nautiloid. It's like a, sort of like a snail, I guess. See, and here's, here's the end of one. It's a big one. Well, this is a pretty big one here. Oh, look, look up here. Here's a, here's a little sample. See this right here? Uh -huh. What is that? So that's this, one of these sticking out this way. You see the end of it. Isn't that neat? Jesse, are you starting to like hiking more? Mm -hmm. Are you? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. River guide Troy Booker never tires of running the Colorado. It's probably 240 miles of some of the best scenery and things that you could possibly ever imagine. I mean, you're basically down a canyon that at points can be close to about a mile deep. Right up here, you've got the Tapete Sandstone, which is about 570, 600 million years old. It goes all the way up above us here. And that's this whole layer of... Right, everything that's all finely eroded. And then down here, you've got the schist. And this is somewhere between 1.7 and 2 billion years old, depending on who you talk to. Some of the oldest rock. Yeah. There's only a few places on the planet where something this old is actually exposed. Wow. Far out. I try not to say that anymore, but sometimes it's just, it's appropriate. In a place so ancient, time itself seems to lose all meaning. A prehistoric culture lives by the river's edge for hundreds of years then mysteriously disappears. Its entire existence, a split second in the life of the canyon. But time plays tricks here, and eight short days on the Colorado can yield memories that last a lifetime.
A trip down the river makes impressions that never fade. And over the years, Troy has seen how the Colorado casts its spell. This place puts a lot of people at peace. You get away, you get away from telephones and business, and you can come down here and just drop all that. Live very simply, you know, with what you have is what you got. If you forgot it, you don't need it. It's a pretty simple existence and a pretty magical place. It's personal experiences that John turns into music. And this trip down the Colorado adds another verse to his new song. up you never know there's something about where the sun sets that's different than where the sun rises where the sun rises shines on what we have today but where the sun sets promises another tomorrow which is opportunity, which is possibility. Over that ridge is a bright new world where all your dreams can come true. And for humankind, the horse was the first creature that could take us there.
What a spot. Great scenery. Are those horses? Sure look like it. 20 years after riding eagles and horses, John joins biologist Joel Berger in Wyoming's Red Desert for a closer look at the inspiration for the song. The horses sometimes gather in herds more than 100 strong, but they are actually a collection of small, tight-knit bands under the vigilant protection of their own stallions. Running free on the open range, they are a living reminder of the Wild West. I think that one of the things that happens when we experience or observe any creature in the wild is the inspiration that it gives us about individual freedom, courage, being able to take care of yourself, take care of your own, and create your own life. They don't have any predators, maybe us, except us. I just can't believe that we're seeing this many in one bunch. You know, horses out here in the Red Desert are pretty unusual. They form these big groups that you don't see in wild horses elsewhere. Well, so what happens then when you get a bunch of bands together like this and you have... Like they're certainly scattering and males are just leaving and running like crazy. What we're seeing are a bunch of four and five-year-olds probably, certainly younger males. Feeling their oats? Yeah, exactly. Wow. You keep thinking that there's a fence someplace, that somewhere these animals are domesticated to a degree, and yet every time that we've approached them, their alertness, their skittishness, they are wild creatures. Less than 200 herds of wild horses remain in the West, and their numbers are dwindling. The open range is becoming a thing of the past, and like much of the wild, the horses are losing their freedom. I want to take what I see, what I get out of the world around me, which is inspiring to me, and I want to pass that along to people who maybe don't have the same opportunity to sit out here under this big sky and watch those horses over there and be moved by them and, and be uplifted by their existence and by their freedom, by their spirit. I love all things that are wild. And I think that there's a wildness in each of us as human beings. It's what draws me to these creatures and the places where they live. No place remains as wild as Alaska. Bush pilot and longtime friend Stu Ramstad is John's guide into the vast backcountry. How long have you been flying? 42 years. 42 years. That's yeah. the only way to get around up here. The only way. The wings are the way. <laughs> wings are the way. A little fire under the wings and away you go. That's, uh, that sure beats walking. <laughs> Alaska to me epitomizes everything about the West. It's a frontier. It's the incredible landscape. It's wildlife. It's wilderness, wilderness, the, the greatest thing about nature, wilderness. Wilderness conservation first brought John here in 1975. In the wake of the energy crisis, many were looking to Alaska for new supplies of oil and gas. I did this film called Alaska American Child. And the whole notion that we came up with was that Alaska was the offspring of the lower 48 United States. And that everything that had happened in the United States in a period of close to 200 years 
was happening in a very rapid time frame in Alaska, like 10, 20 years. My discovery of Alaska was what the film was about. American child was the call of the wild of a singing through the mist of your dreams. A fly what I discovered was some of it was good, some of it was not so good. Some of it was going to have enormous impacts on, on people and people's lives, on the landscape, on the environment. We used the film to lobby for the Alaska Lands Act. The Alaska Lands Act of 1980 protected more than 100 million acres of pristine wilderness from careless development. For his contribution, John was invited to speak at the White House. Alaska, to me, is America's child. It will inevitably grow and develop, but it doesn't need to do that in a way that causes its innocence and its beauty to disappear. We can add growth in Alaska without losing naturalness and without losing the wilderness. So what is it about Alaska, Stu? I mean, aside from everything about Alaska. Well, it's, it's the trip through the country, like right here. It's the mountains. It's the glaciers hanging. It's the sheep in the hill right over there. There's a beaver house right there. The place is alive. It's September and silver salmon are running up Big River on Alaska's southern coast. John began fishing here 20 years ago. The company of grizzlies adds to the adventure. The salmon arrive in waves on each high tide from Bristol Bay. Hungry seals pursue them in from the sea. It's a big silver! <laughs> this guy's all the way across the creek. What a brute. Old Stu catches fish everywhere. Oh yeah, he's a beauty. I could see him flash when he came after at one time. We got a fish! Oh, whoa! Woo! Oh, there he goes. He wants to go. Boy, this guy don't quit. He's... They just don't quit at all. Look at this, Hummer. Look at that. Golly, that's pretty. Nice fish, a little five pound rod. This was to be John's last trip to Alaska. One month later, he was tragically killed in a plane accident in California. But here at Little Mulchatna, he finished his last song, the song he was writing for this film. Oh. We only have this home recording, but as always, it speaks to the deepest needs of the human heart. He called it Yellowstone, coming home. Returning, forever returning.
A life in the wilderness is priceless to Stu and his family. For three generations, they've carved a living from the land in Alaska. Stu built his wilderness lodge in 1963, 17 years before the surrounding area was designated Lake Clark National Park. We're the wealthiest people in the world land-wise because we own this property. and. Uh... It's something you come to value when you travel and you see seven wilderness lodges looking at each other. And they don't need a spyglass to do it. Here, we're in it. This is the place. John first came to Stu's Little Mulchatna Lodge in 1976. Hundreds of miles from the nearest road, the lodge has become a refuge a home away from home, far from the persistent obligations that accompany celebrity life. At peace in its remote beauty, John's mind often turns to music. He's written songs here that uh, Born in a Cabin on Little Malchatna, things that uh, make my heart thump a little bit. Cabin on Little Mulchatna, raised in hard times, but I had a good life from the first time I flew with my father's seat. I knew that I'd wind up a bush pilot's wife. We sleep near the sound of a slow running river. I wake up most mornings to a drizzling rain, and we live every day like the first or the last one, with nothing to lose and heaven to gain. Here's to the people, here's to the wild, and here's to the free. Here's to my life in a chosen country. Here's to Alaska and me. And oh, for a fire on a cold winter's night. And once more to gaze at the great northern lights. For all of the beauty my children will see. Here's to Alaska and me. John often sings of freedom and belonging. And in Alaska's Lake Clark National Park, there's a creature that embodies both, the caribou. You don't have to see the caribou to know and recognize the trails of their passage. And every time they pass, all the grasses, all of the mosses are stomped right down. It looked like there's been a motorcycle race through the country, wow. just uh, torn right down to the roots. I was told by the Park Service it's the most that's ever been in the park, 100,000 plus. You think we'll see that many? Oh, yeah. We're going to track them down and, and find them. So there's a little bunch over there, but that's, are they stragglers? 
they spin off groups of up to a thousand. Will there be uh, many predators following a herd like this? The uh, bears will be <laughs> making themselves available along the timbered areas of the migration. What about wolves? Uh, wolves also. Yeah. Wolves should be uh, first in line. They're the main predator of the caribou. Look at all the caribou. God, I've never seen so many animals. How far do they stretch out here? As far as you can see, as far as I can see here, I'd, I'd say eight to ten miles. I've never seen so many animals in one place. Probably won't anywhere else. I mean, everywhere you look, there's yep. more animals than I've ever seen in one place. How old are the calves? Oh, they're probably a month old, month and a half now, I think. Do they slow down to have them or have Not them on much. the march? They're ready to roll in a day or two, you know. I mean, still pretty spindly, but they, they, they manage to keep up with these bigger animals. I've just never seen so many animals. It's quite a march. You got a intent and purpose <laughs> to keep moving. The caribou must keep moving. If they graze in one place too long, the land will take decades or more to recover. But over thousands of years, the caribou have worked out a partnership with these lands. They keep on the move, and the tundra sustains them. Incredibly, there are times when a hundred thousand animals can simply vanish into the immense landscape. Well, if they just keep coming, they'll come right over us. On both sides of us. get a little wind of us and they're sniffing. What is that? All they need to see is one little bit of movement. We've been staying awful still. Oh yeah, but they got awful close too. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard not to want to look when you can hear them breathing and snorting right over here. Yeah. I can lay down. We're right in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. They're going by all around us. Well, that little one's spooked. To me, any experience that I have of, of, of wildness, anytime I see a wild creature, it somehow reminds me of, of who I am, where I come from, and what's possible for me. And all of that is very uplifting. There are times I fear I lose myself. I don't know who I am. I get caught up in the struggle and the strain. Then my heart turns to Alaska. Freedom on the run I can hear her spirit calling me To the mountain I can rest there To the river I will be strong
it feels good to see something wild and free because we too want to be wild and free and there's so much especially in modern day society it's it's no wonder that these creatures are disappearing because so is that aspect of our lives but we can remember that as long as there are wild places and wild things we can remember that part of ourselves which is a big part i think of what makes us human beings <laughs>